right, so um, obviously from the garage you have an incredible collection. We know you're a huge, passionate car guy. And for me, Alan, I'm very curious, where did that passion come from? How old were you when you, know, you first saw like, one car and then that, that's when it just changed for you? Well, I grew up in New England, which is uh, the new version of the old England, <laughs> New England. Uh, you know, it's a pretty, it was a rural area, so you just had to fix tractors and lawnmowers and every 12, 13 year old kid had an old car in a field that you could just go out and work on and drive around. I mean, it's not like now. Now if you drive an old car in a field, the police come and then the environmental people get you and then you, you get arrested for any number of offenses. But back then you could actually drive old cars around in fields and that's what kids did. You just did that until you got your license, you know. So that's sort of where it, uh, where it came from. Wow. Okay. And what was your first car? My first car was a 1934 Ford pickup truck. Uh, I bought it when I was 14, and um, it didn't run. And I spent two years trying to get ready. And you know, I would have nightmares when I was a kid. Like, oh, what if I can't drive a stick? <laughs> what if I'm like the only guy that doesn't have? What if I just couldn't do it? I, I'm used to you know, you know, when you were a kid, you these are things you think about. It's really stupid, but uh, no, it was great. It was a 34 Ford uh, flathead V8, and we put a 292 V8 in it. And, uh, you know, it, it was fun. And I remember when I was a child, I mean, maybe when I was 12 years old, I had a, a post on my wall. And for me, the car post that I have is the Lamborghini Countach. Iconic car, I know there's also one. Yeah, there's one sitting, sitting over there, yeah. yeah. What was yours? Did you have any posts on your wall? Any, any cars you aspired to? Obviously, you know, well, you know, when actually. you grew up in a little town, it was, it's not like now. Now you can get on the internet, you can, you can see any car you want at any time. When you grew up in a little town, you waited every month for the magazine to come out to have the pictures, usually not in color. And it was the kind of place where you'd go up to the local McDonald's and you'd hang around at 10 o'clock at night, nothing. Then you go home, and at 10.30 the phone would ring, hey, I'm still here, Corvette drove through. Oh, I just said a Cor Corvette drove through. Oh, we didn't see. Because when you grow up in a rural community, anything less with less than four doors might as well be a Ferrari. You know, your parents had whatever, you know, four-door Falcon, whatever, which is whatever it was. So just to see cars was a huge deal when I was a kid because you just didn't, you only saw them in magazines, you know. That's true, yes. No, the magazines uh, is where I think a lot of the, the dreams came from for a lot of people like myself. myself oh, sure, myself. sure. I mean, that, that was the only place you could see it. Even, at least in America, when they covered car racing on TV, oh, it would be an afterthought. It would be 15 minutes at the end of, you know, some sports program and, the guy would be standing in front of the car, so you couldn't see it, and it was a horrible. You know. So, so obviously, growing up, all these magazines, different vehicles, you'd love to aspire. And obviously, now today, we've seen you have an incredible connect collection. So, how did that come about? The collection? Well, I just never sold anything. I, I just always kept every car okay. since I. You know, the great thing about California is you see people driving fifty-year-old cars, and you go, "Hey, are you a collector?" I go, "No, this is my car," because it doesn't. There's no salt on the roads. It doesn't rain that often. So cars don't rust. I mean, you see mid-60s MGs and Triumphs, and, and they're completely rust-free. And of course, English people go crazy because, it's, you know, after two years in England, <laughs> body shell has fallen off the chassis. You know, whereas here, you, you can drive stuff forever. So that's the great part about it. It is amazing. And you do have that problem. And that's why a lot of our friends come over here and import them over. And, uh, and yeah, absorb. yeah. I, I mean, yeah. So I just never saw... I never thought of it. I, I didn't set out to be a car collector. I just would drive something and put it away, and then something else would come along. Oh, and then a couple months later, I'd go back. It, it's a bit like imagine every girl you went out with in high school still looks the same, and they're waiting for you. You know, that's exactly what it's like. You come in and go, Oh, I haven't driven that in a year and a half. Oh, God, I forgot how much I liked it. You know, so that's, that's why. And plus, I, I'm not a stock and bond guy, I don't know much about investments. But I know that I like cars, and I figure if I like it, somebody else would like it, you know. Um, I mean, I bought this F1 McLaren when they were reasonably cheap, and now they're crazy. I mean, that yellow Lamborghini mirror over there, I got for free. What happened was Dean Martin bought it new. I didn't know Dean. Uh, his kid uh, blew the engine, and it sat at a repair shop. A buddy of mine bought it, thinking he could fix it. Now, this is the 80s, and the dealer said, it's going to cost more to fix, and it's worth, you might as well junk it. So his wife said, 
give it to Leno. He could probably fix it. He, okay. So he gave it to me. And of course, now he's hung himself because it's a million dollar car. But back then, it was just an old. It's hard to think now. That's when you know you're really old. When cars are incredibly valuable now, had no value at all. But you know, a Lamborghini with a blown motor. Well, who wants that? You know. You know. So, but I mean, nowadays that's like the holy grail. But back then, so most of these I got fairly inexpensively. So what was, what's your favorite one? I mean, I guess that's the tough question. Well, it depends what you like. I mean, the steam cars are great fun. Mm -hmm. I like any car that is not a normal driving experience. We live in an era now where government regulations, all cars, headlights have to be this high, the gear selector must go, park, reverse, neutral, drive. You know, you get an old cars and things are just all over the place. Sometimes the throttle pedal's in the middle. I mean, sometimes the shifter's over here. I mean, it's, it's, it's just different. So anything that provides a different driving experience is fun to me. So which car would you say would best describe Jay Leno as a personal character? What car would you say would be like the one? This oh, which car is like a complete phony that has no power at all? I, I don't know. I can't figure out which one. Now, I don't think, I don't really aspire myself to put my personality in the car. I mean, I, I just... I enjoy just driving them. You know, there are certain quotes. I remember David E. Davis from Automatic, Automobile Magazine said, uh, everybody should drive a V12 car at least once in their lifetime. And when I read that, I was probably a, a kid, and I, I thought, well, I, when would I ever get to drive a V12 car, you know? So when I finally did, oh, I, I saw what he was talking about, you know? So it, those things make you want to aspire to. Sure. to and so when you choose the car, is it more of a... Well, any car that's ahead of its time in its time is interesting to me. Any car that's a noble failure, any car where the engineer sought out to make something so much better than what people really needed. And when it comes to the real world market, like next door I have the Chrysler turbine car. And there's no reason for a turbine car unless you really want to have a different sort of experience. I mean, it idles at 22,000 RPM. It's incredibly smooth. Uh, and it's just, and, but to the average person, well, why would I pay more for that when this engine works perfectly fine? I mean, we live in an era now where most people see vehicles as they would a refrigerator or a washing machine, just something to get from point A to point B. You know, so to me, I like it from the collector point of view, from the artistic point of view. I like cars that do one thing. It's built to be stylish. Fine. I don't want an SUV that can also carry lumber and take passengers. I don't want a car that does everything. I like cars that do one thing really well. And, and, that's, and it, that's just one of the criteria. So then how does that then lead to your garage? How does that, you know, you obviously you've got this great idea to obviously put out a YouTube channel with some great videos, some great people. And how did that come about? How did the YouTube channel come about? Well, um, I was doing The Tonight Show, and I thought it would be fun to do a YouTube show just on cars. And uh, we just started filming videos, and um, it got to be pretty popular. So then we took it to network TV, where we bring in a few celebrities and do a bit of things, but it's still primarily uh, about cars. Um, we, you know, the fun part is when you see most of these kind of cars, they're driven very sedately around a roped-off area because the owner doesn't want anybody to, you know. Whereas when you, it's like a Lamborghini Espada or a Mura, when you see it with a rope around it in a static shot, it's interesting. When you see it out on the road and you realize, oh my God, look how big that truck is. Look how tiny the car is. Compared. When you see it compared to other cars, that's what comes alive for me. That was always interesting to me, you know, when I would watch movies where they were driving, like the Italian job. We, you'd see the car in its natural element on the street, and then you go, wow, that really, it looks so much better than on the stand at the Geneva Auto Show, for example. You know? So that's the idea, to, to just be a regular guy driving these kind of cars. I'm not a race car driver. I don't pretend to be. I mean, I love Chris Harris's videos and Top Gear Boys and all that kind of stuff. But I just try to relate what the average person would do if they could afford to have some of these things. Yeah, that's the fun part about it. That's the fun part. And so, out of all the episodes you've done so far, what would you say is the most memorable in terms of vehicle and obviously the person that was there at the time? Is there a specific one that stands out for you? 
Well, people like to steam cars because one blew up in my face. So they like oh. people like to see it catch on fire. That's always fascinating to the viewer. Um, we got to we did a rollover in the uh, Hemi under glass when I was a kid. Bob Riggle was the big guy who drive the Hemi under glass. Remember the front end would come up like this. And we had him on the show, and he got a little over exuberant in the car. We did a, a roll, and the car flipped over, and, and people love that. You know. Anytime you get hurt, catch on fire, people love that. It's been the most excellent possible. Yeah. Yes. So it comes to how do you choose the cars? Because you do have an incredible variety, which is what we do with our magazine. We have an eclectic mix. So how do you choose them? Is it do you go to shows and you see them and you go, do you know what? I'd love to find out more about this one. No, sometimes the cars find you. Um, people call and they've got an old car in their bed. I mean, I prefer to buy a car that needs, well, every car needs a bit of work anyway. I mean, there are people who do wonderful cosmetic work and there are people who do wonderful mechanical work. There's very rarely people who can do both. Uh, so a lot of times you buy something, it looks fantastic, but it's been sitting in a museum for 20 years, so the fuel system has got to be gone through and whatever it is. And vice versa, the cars that people run every day that look awful, well, they need all the chrome and the bright work done and all that kind of stuff. So um, we enjoy doing it all here at, at the shop. It's nice to see Variety spices life, they You know, I mean, the reason that you say, how do you choose what you want to look at? You know, a lot of times I'll be reading one of the magazines. Oh, it just sounds so exciting, the guy talking about it. i got to find one of those, you know. And that's sort of what you do. Plus, any car that reflects back on your youth is, is interesting. You know, when I was a kid, I mean, I'd love to get a BB-5. They've just gotten so crazy now. But, you know, when you're a kid and you're watching the James Bond movies and you say to yourself, okay, here's James Bond. He's an accomplished driver, he's in a DB5, and he can't outrun seven Koreans in a 190 diesel Mercedes. He's got to use smoke, and then he's got to shoot the oil on him, and then he's got to have a spray. I mean, why? You'd think James Bond would be ashamed that he's in a DB5, and there are seven Koreans in a, in a Mercedes sedan following him, and he's got to squirt water on him and the smoke screen. Just, yeah, hilarious. One of the things we are passionate about at the moment is the way the evolution of the car is going. You way know, the what? The evolution of the car, so artificial intelligence, the different type of funeral alternatives. What are your thoughts? Because I know one episode you had, a, I think it was a 3D scanner also. Right, right. You know, with the technology where you can know, see old parts that you can't actually buy anymore. That's the future of the old car hobby. I mean, there are no junkyards anymore. I mean, for environmental reasons, you can't have thousands of cars lying in fields putting various oils and gasolines back into the ground. I mean, you just can't. I mean, it's just logical. If you're going to be in the hobby, you have to be responsible. So you say, so where are you going to get a piece of script that says Capri or whatever it is you want? Well, now with a 3D printer, you can just make whatever you want. And, and that's really the future of the, of the car hobby. As far as autonomous cars and all that stuff goes, I, I'm a, I, I think it's great. You know, most cars are autonomous now. I see people driving around the route putting on lipstick, they're reading a magazine, they're on the phone. I mean, there's nobody driving that car. So, look, if you're not going to do it, let the computer do it. You know, and that's fine. Because there'll always be, I mean, I, I really think the future will be your Lamborghinis, your Ferraris, all these kind of cars. They'll be like snowmobiles. You'll use it on the weekend to go to the car meet or to drive out in the mountains. And then during the week, you take your semi-electric hybrid. Because, I mean, let's face it, what fun is a Ferrari in London traffic? It's not. You just... You're just sitting there. I mean, in fact, I read the other thing. I think the average speed in London is now eight point something miles per hour. Yet in 1880, with a horse and wagon, it was 8.9 miles. So it was actually faster back in the day. So, I mean, that's the world you live in now. You know? but, but I, yeah, I, I'm one of those people who believes engineers will change the world. I mean, cars that would have killed you when I was 16. You walk away from now. I mean, I see on the highway all the time, I see, uh, you know, some 16-year-old kid and the SUV's up in a ball and they're on the phone, Dad, can you come get me? You would have been dead when I was 16. So, I mean, I think that's that, that's genu genuine progress. Yeah, no, we, we feel the same way, so we're embracing that. Because we have a lot of, of our fans who are like, well, you know, it's not the old school way of being, you know, you don't have that sound smell. We get that, but also know. We well, the scary that. part is when you take a kid who grew up with car with anti-lock brakes and traction control and then you put them in a 65 Mustang or whatever and even an old MG I mean they're stunned there's nothing there to save them 
you know, it's, it's, it's frightening, you know. And that's the most memorable driving experience you've ever had, whether it be in, in the States or in another country. Do you have anything that stands out to you? Whether it was the car or just the experience that you had? Well, I did the Amelia Amelia. That was, that was great fun in an XK120. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that. That was fun. Um, almost every, you know, you've got hills here up in Malibu, and everybody thinks LA traffic is terrible, which it is. But if you go 10 miles in either direction, well, not by that way, you'll be in the ocean. You go 10 miles that way, and you're up in the hills, you won't see another car. And it's like driving in Sicily. You've got all through the hills and the mountains. I mean, here in LA, it can be 80 degrees, and there's snow on the mountain right there. And you can drive up to the snow line and turn around and come back. So. Uh, almost every drive is sort of memorable to me. I, especially when you're driving a 1913 Mercer or a Spanish Suiza or something like that. Um, yeah, it's it's all great fun. I um, mean, driving in England was fun for me. Uh, you know, going out to the McLaren factory and then driving to the Cotswolds and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of memorable drives. So just a couple more questions. So yeah. One of them is uh, favorite tracks to, to listen to while you're driving. Do you have any kind of music tracks or any songs? You know, this is the one for me when I go out. No, I don't really. I, I like listening to the car. Um, you know, I used to have all these recordings of engine noises. You could buy these records that had the sounds of Sebring or whatever. And I would play these, and my, my wife would literally run out of the car. She just, it's just, to her, it was just like, <laughs> it's just static. I go, no, that's a Bugatti. Listen, can you hear the Bugatti? Can you hear the dudes and birds? No, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And so I would, so that, no, so there's no, I don't really, I enjoy the whole automobile. I mean, to me, this is one of my pet peeves of modern cars. I've got an NSX in there, it's a wonderful car, but you, you, you do this. Are you used to make a selection? Yes. How happy are you with your selection? Very. Just let me hit the button, okay? Please, just shut up. Just, I mean, you literally have to take your eyes off the road to where I just, for AM, FM, thank you. That's all. I, you know, either talk radio or music, thank you. I don't want to, it, it, it drives me crazy. Inspiration for the car will inspire you and people will stand out. Well, I mean, I like any, any car that is one man's vision. I don't say that to be sexist because back in the day, it was mostly men. I mean, now you have a woman designed the new NSX. There's a lot of women in the industry. But back in the day, Fred Duesenberg, W.O. Bentley, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, what's his name? Frederick Blanchester, excellent. Uh, Mark Burkett, Hispanic Swayze. These are guys, the car from top to bottom is their vision. Uh, Isagonis always used to make me laugh because he did the Mini, but he didn't like radios. So you couldn't get a Mini with a radio. So there was a huge aftermarket of people selling. I mean, his, you know the... You know, the motor company's going crazy. We can make a lot of money. No, I don't want a radio in the car. You know, Gordon Murray designed this car. No radio. No radio. It's hilarious. But you also get their passion, which is what I like. So whether it's Gordon Murray or W.O. Bentley or Fred Duesenberg or Enzo Ferrari, those are the cars I like. The cars designed by committee. I mean, so many modern cars. Like a Camry is a wonderful car, but I don't believe it inspires any passion because... Uh, Bob did the rear end, Larry did the front end, Susan did the middle, somebody else did it. So it's just like the level of, is that too much? Is that, you know, somebody like the Dodge Viper, people will love it or they hate it and think it's a cartoon. But at least there's passion on both sides. You know, so many modern cars are just appliances where they're just, they're all kind of white or gray and they have four doors and, and they're comfortable. But you don't, you don't bond with the car, you know. The fun thing about older cars is that you uh, you get this sense of accomplishment if it breaks down and you, and you fix it and you can get it home. I mean, I mean, the only tool you use in a modern car now is a cell phone. I mean, you call and somebody comes to get you. You know, like the McLaren, probably the last proper British car to come with a toolkit. But like you're actually going to take out your toolkit and fix your McLaren F1 by the side of the road with your pliers and your screwdriver. <laughs> but I just like the idea of it, you know. So it leads to the last one last question. Yes. Um, a lot of our fans probably, you know, here watching this today and they're aspiring one day to either own their dream car or right. make a collection of cars. Do you have any advice any a car person who's like, you know, one day how can I inspire myself to get to the level or at least have the magic car? Do you have any words you might be Well I, I I would tell people to um 
for example, I really think the next collector car for a generation will be the first generation Miata. I mean, here was a car that came along, twin cam, plenty of horsepower, five-speed transmission, light handled. Uh, it was essentially almost a Lotus with the reliability back if they didn't have back in the day. But they built so many of them, they weren't worth anything. When I was a kid, you could buy a Shelby GT350 Mustang for $600 because they were just clapped out Mustangs. You know, when the Mustang came out, the first year they built a million of them. And they said they'll never be collectible because they built so many of them. Well, they're, they're collectible because everybody had one and they want to go back and have one again. So the idea is to just try to think ahead as to what you think might be a future collectible and maybe drive that car now. Like the Miata will always be fun to drive. And the first generation was the lightest and the simplest, no airbag, proper steering wheel, all this kind of stuff. But now they're so common, yeah, I don't want that. But 10 or 15 years, oh my God, I wish I could go back and find one of those. And then you'll wind up paying a big price for it. I mean, almost every car here I bought when they were not much, I mean, there's a blue Maserati over there. Um, when I got it, I paid $25,000 for it. All I did was did the engine, um, put a clutch in it, a few other little things. Uh, and now it's uh, $350,000. I, I don't know why it is, but I liked it back then. I bought it because I liked it. Don't buy it because you think it'll go up. Because if it doesn't go up, now you're mad. You know? But if you buy it because you like it and it doesn't go up, at least you still like it. You know? So to me, in England, what do they call them? We call it the Capri. Is it, they call it the same thing? And they, I mean, that's basically a miniature Mustang V6. You can get all kinds of power out of it. But they're common. You go, I don't want one of those. But another 10 years, you won't be able to find one. It's like Volkswagen Beetles. They were all over the place in America. And then they disappeared one day. Now people are paying 50, 60 grand for a Volkswagen Beetle. So uh, I would say if, if you don't have much money, Keep your eye out for something that would be collectible. I mean, all those crazy British sedans from the 60s that sort of look like miniature Rolls Royces with the wood timber dash and the manual shift. I mean, they're just funny, but they're, they've got big, comfortable seats and they, the Wolseley and all those kind of cars. I mean, I find them fascinating because they're a piece of heritage and maybe your dad had one or your grandfather had one. You rode one as a kid, so that makes them desirable. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.